a warm welcome to you, each and every one of you. I'd like to, to welcome the board here, the chair. I'd like to welcome you as an audience, as a family. I would think that in this hall, uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge the hall, and to Nui here, I'd like to acknowledge the Tonga in this place. And I'd like to acknowledge the, the history of this place. I think all of us have been coming here. If you're an Aucklander, you've come as a child, you've come as an adult, you've brought your grandchildren here, I guess you still are coming here. This place is much loved. It's been a very special place in Auckland's heart and mind. It's been a part of our growing up and it's been a part of adult history. It's been part of our lives. Hamish and I, I guess, are gonna share a running gag, which the elephant in the room. There's only one elephant here, really, which is Raja. Um, which sits there decaying slightly. But I guess the elephant in the room is about the recent history of this place. And I'd like to acknowledge that. And I'd like to acknowledge that I think there's been some pain and there's been some grief. And this isn't really about that. It's not about examining what went wrong, the bumpy bits of earlier this year, how it happened, why it happened. This, to me, is a healing process, a family coming together to acknowledge what has gone before and seeing how we might go on together. I think that's a kind of process that I'd like to chair this evening, because this evening <coughs> belongs to you, to hear your voice. And you can go anywhere you like, by the way. This doesn't tell you how to think or what to say. I just think we want to hear your voices on what David has put. I, I saw this last week, and I was so inspired. Sir Don had asked me if I'd chair it, and I'd had a bit of a bumpy history too in the last few months, hadn't I? You know that, and I know that. And I thought it was a strange choice to ask me along. But I thought <laughs> even strange to ask Hamish Keith, who always is grumpy and always bad-tempered and, and always brilliant. And I've never always agreed with Hamish, but I've always loved hearing him say it. And Claudia, of course, comes from Tipapa, and I think she's absolutely amazingly good, and is rich in history and knowledge. And Ken, of course, comes from an international point of view. So this is a, a very, very, I think, superb group of people to lead you in conversation. And so the next hour, really, is a conversation between ourselves, after seeing what David's done here, sitting here thinking, this is the beginning of the next step he put on 2020, makes a lot of sense to me. This is an occasion that I think you might look back and say, well, we took the first steps together. That's as I see it. There's a lot more I could say, but I'm just gonna try and glue you together to kind of bring out I don't think that's going to be too hard, your conversation, your thoughts. And so I thought that Hamish could lead off. Hamish, you, <coughs> writer, broadcaster, everything. Troublemaker. Grumpy old man. Troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful Aucklander, wonderful New Zealander, and someone who's strongly opinionated about how museums mm. should be, could be, and will be. Hamish Keith. Thank you, Rob. Um, those of you who know me will find it odd that I've already, in advance, know what I'm going to say. I usually don't. But we're on the barbecue pitch here, which is short and brutal. And uh, <clears throat> what I need to say may seem both those things. But I do want to acknowledge Bob's uh, acknowledgement of the elephant in the room, to which I'd like to add the 200 kilo gorilla on its back. But as Bob says, it's not about that, and to talk about that would be a distraction. So. Um, this conversation that we're having here tonight is not unique to Auckland. In fact, all over the world, museums are waking up with a hangover after a 50 50-year 50 binge of marketing, popularising and pandering begun by Thomas Hoving in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the 1960s. And they then measured their success by counting heads instead of uh, <coughs> paying heed to what, if anything, they were putting in those heads. Um, 
now in that hangover, looking at busted budgets, uh, declining audiences, decaying buildings, they can now see dimly through the fog that under whatever other words are written on the classical portals of their buildings, there is one other set, which, are the, which is the undeniable and consistent mission of museums anywhere, in any place, and at any time. It is the collections, stupid. Museums are their collections. Museums are driven by their collections. Their audiences are for their collections. Their vision is shaped by their collections. And they have ignored that message at our peril. The museum exists so these collections, these wonderful Tonga here, can have a conversation with me. Museum does not exist so the museum can have a conversation with me about these things. The role of the museum is to engage, not to intervene. To establish a lifetime's relationship and not a brief sensation. As I once said about the experience of working in a museum or a gallery, the relationship you have with works of art is a lifetime thing and bears as much the, the in the door and out the door once bears as much relationship to a genuine relation with art as does five minutes in a massage parlor with true love. <laughs> the buzzword for this is narratives, and you've heard that word a lot, and I'm sure you'll hear more of it. But there are false narratives, and there are glib sound bites. When that magnificent polychromatic house, Hotanui, came into this museum, it was painted red so as to appear more authentically Māori. A false narrative that reduced the complexity of iwi to a false ho homogeneity. When Te Papa opened, Colin McCann's northern panels were hung next to a 1950s refrigerator. A glib soundbite that reduced a passionate and powerful statement about place to an ephemeral moment in commodity fashion. So what is the vision? Who is this museum for? The collections are both the question and the answer. They are our history and our cultures. They are our knowledge of the natural world. When, while the wars that they died in were not always our wars, but the dead memorialized here are our dead. This is our museum. It's not a mall filled with wild factor oddities. It's not a magnet for busloads of tourists. It's not a place for an interactive day of family fun. But if it became genuinely our museum, it might in part be those things. Not a one-off destination, but something to shape us and our children and their children for their lifetimes. The museum defined by its collection is the anchor stone which holds us in this place, in this time, and in our cultures. It's where we define ourselves and the world we are in, from where we view the larger world and our place in that. There's only one option presented tonight that gives the museum any chance of becoming that. That is option four. One building, one approach, three stories. The reality of this museum and its collections is that. But be aware that model needs a lot of development yet. And I'm acutely aware that something similar was the original model for the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa. Until driven by its architecture and not by its collections, it settled for option three. A good reason to biff that particular option without a moment's thought. <laughs> option four represents the reality of this museum, the reality of this place, and its collections, and of us, for whom this museum is. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Um, thank you for that. Um, a couple of weeks ago in the New Zealand Listener, Hamish wrote about the Stendhal effect. Stendhal, the writer, uh, went into a museum and was stunned by what he saw, a painting. He got the trembles. It's really called the Wehi. And I guess each and every one of you have had that experience here. My own personal experience, I come and look at some anchor stones that was found on a ledge at Kerry Kerry in the 1930s. I've been looking at that for 30 years. I brought my children here to look at these anchor stones, and I'm now bringing my grandchildren. 
I'm sure every one of you has got something here in a case, something here that you just keep coming back and all your life you can <coughs> return, showing it and you'll have that wehi effect. Uh, Hamish, I thought uh, what you said made a lot of sense. I hope the audience feels that as opening up the, the conversation and the thoughts. It gives me great pleasure to ask Claudia Orange, Dame Claudia Orange, uh, for the last three years I served on the board of Te Papa. Sorry about that, Hamish. I know <laughs> I've done an awful, got some awful things in my <laughs> life. That was probably, I thought, your thought, that one of them. But in fact, I found it hugely <laughs> enjoyable. And I did get the Stendhal effect many times wandering through uh, Te Papa. One of the great relationships was the board and Dame Claudia. Her knowledge, her experience, her richness of Māori history, the treaty, of course, which is there and part of it, uh, is uh, here in every part of this great building. It gives me great pleasure to ask Dame Claudia Thanks. Orange to address us. Thanks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, kia ora tātou katoa, and ngā mihi ki a koutou i tēnei pō. And really warmest greetings. You might wonder why I'm here. Um, well, I'm an Aucklander. And someone said to me recently, in fact, it was Sir Don's brother, Ian, who's the deputy mayor in Wellington, he said, surely to goodness, Claudia, we've made a Wellingtonian of you. I said, yes, it's a marvellous city to work in, but the place to live is Auckland. <laughs> 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 um, I guess, too, um, I could say that I'm more than just an Aucklander because I grew up in Ponsonby and Hearn Bay. Our apartment is still in Hearn Bay, let out, but I will come back. And um, the harbour was my swimming pool. Um, the courts in Ponsonby, the Green Street courts, were, there, were where I played tennis. I was at school all my life at St Mary's. I learned to read a book a day at Lee's Institute Library, which was the best library, the only first library, I think, for children in Australasia. I visited the museum as a child because my granny loved cricket, and she'd come over to see the cricket at the Domain and of course promised that when it was finished she would bring me to the museum. So I was very happy to accept the invite uh, when Sudan rang me. Um, I've been a very long time actually a, an Auckland Museum member um, and it's really rather ironic that my life has gone full circle uh, from child visiting museums back to actually have the pleasure and honour of working at Te Papa, responsible for all the collections which is a very big bite, and all the research too. <clears throat> and I was fortunate to be able to build on a lot of visits overseas over the years um, where I had actually dragged my husband into many museums, especially in the States, where I think there's been some very interesting developments, particularly uh, with people like Elaine Gurian and others who have talked widely um, about the new museums and how they might work with collections, some of which are very disparate, some of which are ageing. Um, how do you attract people in? Because after all, you might have marvellous collections, but if people don't come in through the door, if they don't sense and have an empathy with those collections, then there's something missing. Um, in other words, what, you might as well have those collections anywhere. But the thing that makes a museum uniquely different is certainly um, the collections they have and the way that curators and collection managers, the directors and the other managers in the museum work with them. Certainly one of the experiences I had in, in travelling in the United Kingdom, but also sometimes in Europe and in Australia too, looking at museums, it's quite clear they come in many shapes and the Auckland Museum is in a sense bound by its shape, just as indeed is the American National History Museum on the Mall bound again by its shape, which actually has certain limits to what you can do. Just as to Papa's building, sometimes we curse it because, in fact, it, we are shaped, in a way, by the exhibitions we can do and the spaces we've got. So, in a way, Hamish, I have to concede you are right. <laughs> Damn, eh? A citadel at the end of the wharf, as some people have called it, and also slightly intimidating. When you talk about museums in many shapes and sizes, um, you really are talking about what collections they have, what, what is their vision, too, about what they want to do. 
and I came back about a month ago from the Museum of Science in Boston, where our big whales exhibition had opened. The whales exhibition both has marvelous collections, but also tells the stories of those collections. It tells the early whaling in New Zealand, and it shows how whale bone was made into such things as bedside tables, um, into beautiful, beautiful ornaments, Maori ornaments, Pacific ornaments. We had major oceanographers from the east coast of the United States who had helped us feed in research of quite sophisticated knowledge. And I suppose it did my heart and, and all our hearts at Te Papa great, uh, you know, great warmth when they said to me, Claudia, we are amazed that such astonishing information can be translated into stories that the public can understand. A whale's heart standing this high and hugely broad. I had a six-year-old grandchild, hugely excited, crawling into the whale's heart and finding out how a heart works. Um, others playing with interactives make a whale. What's the difference between this kind of whale and that kind of whale? The head, the body, the tail. Um, it's, it was interesting too because the Museum of Science actually does have a vision. They came to the conclusion that Americans are getting uh, really rather on the back foot with innovation, a serious thing for Americans. And so they had actually diminished their collection size. I think they gave it to Harvard actually. And then they increasingly built up a huge um, online presence of, of uh, lessons so that uh, thousands and thousands of children could come in and operate in the museum with the um, forces that we know very well, electricity, um, the, 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 the magnetism of the earth, a whole range of things that challenge young people of how, how things work and how to use them, how to create things. So their vision was quite clear. Um, another museum that I think had a very specific vision uh, was the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, about a person in particular, but really about that bigger context of the civil rights in the United States. The Museum of the American Indian, again, quite a different museum that's had great problems because they brought in the people to tell some of the stories and so you tend to get a whole pa patina of stories, actually, Ken, nice. don't you? Nice. Really, a whole, um, a bit like a smorgasbord, almost. Is that the way we want to go here? Maybe it is. <coughs> but Auckland Museum, and coming back to that, it does strike me that there is no museum that tells our stories, that tells the stories of our people, our business. Auckland is business. It doesn't tell the, where, where do we find the stories of our very watery climate, beautiful city to fly into? Um, where do we find out more about, um, how do tourists find out um, about the gateway to our country, um, about the whole diversity and richness of our country? How do uh, we as Aucklanders uh, go out to the world um, and in, in our Auckland environment here, I think there are lots of possibilities. Finally, what do you think your son or your grandson, James here, when you're 20 or 30, James, what are you going to want to see in this museum? What are you going to be wanting to do? Because that's the other thing. Some of the things I think we're finding at Papa is that audiences want to be able to create exhibitions. We're, we have a, an increasing audience that is very, very IT friendly. So how are we going to work with them? Getting our collections online, creating your own um, impressionist um, exhibition for home from perhaps downloading some of the images from collections online or something different, could be natural environment. So there's a challenge to you. Um, what are our grandchildren going to want? Um, what are we going to say then about the objects? What can you say about objects? An old meat grinder that we used to grind up the Sunday mints on, on Sunday nights. Do you remember that? For cottage pie on Mondays. I still miss that. Yes, <laughs> yes said Sir Don. So, if you have stories to tell. 
And I think, too, there are ways that a museum is going to be out, go, able to go out and ask you to contribute those stories to the marvellous objects that it has. And I've talked too much, so I'm about to sit down. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. This morning I spoke to uh, His Worship uh, John Banks about this meeting. I told him that it was going to happen. He seemed delighted that uh, the continuation of Auckland and his romance with this place. We're both gully boys from Newton Gully. We grew up about two streets away from each other. And we talked of coming up here as, uh, as young school kids, me in the 40s, uh, by bus. They would pick us from the schools up. I think we seem to come up every week and be toured around. And then, I think once a month, a huge box would arrive, I guess, in most classrooms. And this box would open up, be a glass case of birds, of treasures, and we'd gather around it and think, this is the museum has come to us. I mean, those things are hugely important. And then when I became the mayor, this place seemed to run out of money and wanted to expand. And so Sir Barry Curtis and I gathered up the other mayors and we went to Wellington and said we'd find the money for the, the redevelopment of the back of this beautiful place. I remember we pledged you know, our future ratepayers for the next 50 years, I think. It didn't matter. We wanted to do it, and so did they. And I guess the government said, the government did say yes. I see Sir Barry's coming back into politics. I think he's 91 or something. Um, <laughs> and he's going to have another go. Um, and Sir Barry and I led that, uh, that charge. And uh, it was so successful, I think about six months later, Judith Tizard was getting on a tractor or a massive earth mover at the back here, and away it was happening. She was Minister for Auckland at that time. And uh, what you see in the back is it was a dream that came true. It seemed to happen in about two years. I'm sure it took a lot longer than that. But the, the rear of this place is also a great entrance too. The next speaker is Ken Corby. And, and what history he has. He, he was in, involved in the experience at Tupapa. He was there, and let me just read this briefly, um, from uh, 1985 to 1990. And he had very many roles establishing Tupapa in what it is. But then he was also the director of the Museum of Projects uh, of, of that institution. But wait, there is more. And there is a, a fantastic thing here, that he is in fact deputy president and he opened the Jewish Museum in Berlin from 1999 to 2002. So he has an international experience in museums, and uh, he's going to say a few words to us too. So warm welcome to you, Ken. The floor is yours. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come here to because I too have a personal story about Auckland Museum. I am an Aucklander, but my career has tended to take me away from this fine city. So I keep coming back because uh, as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old boy, I was a member of the museum club here under Dick Scobie. And every holidays, every August, May holidays, we'd come in here and we'd do interesting things. And I think at that point, I uh, got my love of museums, which has never gone away. And I'm very thankful for that brought my kids back here. Remember the elephant and the alligator and the turtle? Questions from the kids, you know, will the alligator bite the elephant? Will the uh, elephant stand on the, uh, uh, the alligator, etc. It's a wonderful place and it has these fond memories. But I'm not going to tonight talk about or come down on the side of a particular model because I don't think this is my role. My role is normally facilitating exercises like this um, as, as people reach for uh, what their museum should be. So instead, let me stress the importance of the task, how you might frame your approach, for this is an opportunity to really take hold of the future of the museum. What is Auckland Museum to achieve? What is Auckland Museum to be? There are, say, 40,000 museums in this world. Someone's made this estimate, and it sounds about right, and I've seen a few of them, and can only conclude that there is no single model of museum that you have to follow. There is no wrong answer to your deliberations. Rather, I suggest the museums that really work are those, large and small, that have taken the time to decide how they can best be part of the fabric of their owner society. 
and many of these that have worked their way through the process will surprise you in terms of their form and their activity. I'll give you an example of one that's happening at the present moment, a large museum in Australia of not dissimilar size to here at this in Auckland. Looking at the factors that will bear on its reinvention exercise, as well as its traditions and of course its collection and its research expertise, which are so very important. It's looking at the fact that this museum can be part of the centre of gravity of a city of around about two billion people that has this habit of emptying out at about 5.20 every evening. It's in a state that is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. And it's in a state that now has a new tourism strategy, placing great emphasis on bringing tourists into this place. And it is in a city that faces real sustainability challenges, particularly in respect of water and transportation. Now, all these factors are bearing on the museum and what it is destined to become in the coming years. So in respect of forming Auckland Museum, I'm going to draw your attention to three factors. There are many, many others, but here are three that somehow s stay with me as a person looking in uh, from the outside uh, at Auckland and Auckland Museum. First of all, the super city. Auckland Museum can be a lead agency in establishing what it is that super city Auckland becomes. Now, I travel about New Zealand quite a lot, and I can tell you that there is a great deal of goodwill out there in respect of this new way of conceiving of Auckland. Not managing it, let's not worry about that, that's another factor, but conceiving of Auckland and what Auckland really is. We are aware that, as this people outside Auckland, we are aware that a strong Auckland is good for the whole of New Zealand. So ask the question, what is our museum's role in this super city? It's going to be part of your next 10 years. Secondly, tourism. Don't underestimate the power of a good museum in making your city an even more potent attraction for tourists. The great museums of the world, art museums, natural history, history, technology, etc., etc., all of them run surveys to demonstrate just what they add to the wealth of the community by attracting tourists, both international and domestic. And so they should, of course, it matters. It matters to their community that their museum is inputting to their well-being in this way. Thirdly, and this is somewhat arg argu arguable, but I'm going to move towards one of the models. You are the most outward-looking, most international of all New Zealand cities. And I think that this should form a strong part of the framework you decide on for your museum. There are things emerging in David's presentation that start to identify a quite <coughs> unique position for Auckland Museum. And this position will not be the same as other museums, or so I would hope you deserve your own museum. The process will, I'm seeking to get you to engage fully, fulsomely, and take the time necessary to actually make that uh, a series of decisions, that broader societal discussion, which is about making Auckland Museum part of the fabric of your society of Auckland. Thanks very much.